Hello DevOps people, how is everyone? Happy to have you here. Welcome to Full Stack Live, my life coding stream. Even when I've taken time off work, I thought I could still do a little bit of live coding. And um, today I'd like to continue where I left off last time with dockerizing my Ruby on Rails application, how to build a docker file, how to use docker compose and all these things. We found a few things that need a little bit of refinement and uh, that's what I'm going to do today. Guess what? It is raining here in Ireland and uh, so again I'm stuck here in my little home office and uh, what could be better than uh, do some live coding with you? I hope everything is good wherever you are. Um, and uh, I'm quite happy. Today, actually, I started missing work. Uh, it's been almost two weeks now that I've been off work and um, I made an, a conscious effort of not thinking about work stuff, not um, peeking into our Slack chat and things like that. And um, so uh, I'm pretty sure that really helps me to recharge. I feel well rested and this morning I thought hmm, I could use some some work. I could do some work. Um, uh, doing some work would be a nice change and uh, that's always a good sign when you start missing work. Well, I, I can't complain because I really love my job, but uh, um, it also is good to, to really switch off and uh, really get some rest. And I think um, two weeks is a good duration for taking time off because you probably need the first week to, to really decouple and uh, then um, you can take the rest of the time to recharge your batteries and uh, uh, do things uh, that are fun and uh, have nothing to do with what might otherwise stress you out, sometimes at least. Speaking of work, hey Marcus, how you doing? I hope you're keeping well. I hope uh, manning the fort isn't too stressful on you. Um, uh, but rest assured, I will uh, happily drop in on Monday and uh, give you all the support that I can. All right, so yeah, um, what else is going on here? Um, I'm still struggling with my keyboard. I've um, got myself not only an author linear keyboard, um, I'm going to show you that later if you haven't seen it yet, and uh, to make things worse, I also switched to a different keyboard layout, which means my different letters and symbols aren't where they used to be. I'm using the Colmac layout because Colmac is optimized for touch typing and uh, it uh, makes an effort of moving everything near the home row where you usually rest the four fingers of each of your hands and um, definitely uh, it feels better typing however um, it totally messes with my brain and I'm still struggling to to uh, find the right keys I really have to make an, a conscious effort of uh, remembering where things are and uh, I definitely uh, feel it especially when I can't fully focus because um, I'm not typing um, sentences like during coding for example that makes it much harder and uh, takes a lot more focus or for example uh, while I'm uh, chatting with someone and uh, want to quickly type a response um, that little bit of pressure definitely also um, makes it much harder to, to type uh, correctly without your old muscle memory taking over and you're pressing your um, familiar QWERTY keys with, uh, which, which will always result in gibberish on the screen. 
risk. So that's something where I'm, uh, uh, where I'm uh, still putting a lot of work. You moved to the woods. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I saw um, uh, an, uh, a photo on, on Twitter and uh, that really looked nice. Uh, so if, if you found a spot in the woods where you still have uh, mobile data reception, uh, that sounds really awesome. And you seem to have better weather than, than us, so um, I'm a little bit envious. I would love to, to uh, well, not work outside, but spend a little bit of time outside with my iPad. Um, but uh, that's out of the question at the moment. Uh, since there's not really a place where I could sit at a table. I'm, I might go to the park and sit on a bench there, but uh, having the iPad on your lap isn't really something that I want to do um, for more than 10 minutes or so. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I really am a little bit jealous of your spot in the woods. And unfortunately, um, None of the few coffee shops that are near where I live um, have outside seating. So even if the weather was better, um, I wouldn't be able to, to uh, go and uh, get a cup uh, elsewhere than at home. So yeah, that's the situation. At least um, I uh, can sit outside in our backyard if it doesn't rain, which is not a lot of uh, well of which there are not a lot of opportunities at the moment guess summer's over here so uh, yeah i love to prepare for fall however fall is a nice uh, season uh, it's one it's I, I think it's definitely my my f most favorite season uh, i really like um seeing uh, the leaves uh, turn colorful as on my um desktop picture at the moment that's a really nice scene that also seems to be happening in fall let me switch my screen so you can see what i'm talking about uh, here we go doesn't that look lovely i would enjoy taking a walk in the sun over there i wonder where that is it's probably america somewhere but we have very similar scenes over here as well Yeah, um, what else? Uh, Julian, hi, how are you doing? I hope you're keeping well over there in Germany as well. Okay, so I guess uh, we can switch over and uh, do some rails development or rather docker development environment building let me set my scene quickly before i switch over and uh, so what's keeping you busy um as always let's make this thing an interactive show and um if there's anything that you'd like to share or to comment on um pop into twitch chat and let us know what is keeping you busy at the moment? What is making you happy at the moment? Uh, let's uh, do a little bit of show and tell here. Let us know what uh, lifts your spirit. So uh, let me get my VS Code window open. New window. You can put that away. What's happening? Oh, yeah. Recent Rails Docker. There we go. And uh, let me try and uh, yeah, make this a little bit bigger. All right, I think we're ready to go. So let's get started. Here we are, this is my 
Rails Docker workspace and uh, let me open the terminal just to check that uh, Docker is actually available. Uh, I probably should use PS or something. Yes. Okay, and my Docker app is still running from uh, four days ago. Right, yeah, my last stream was on Saturday. I skipped my Tuesday slot. I didn't feel like it, and uh, since it's my second week off uh, work, I, I thought I wouldn't put pressure on myself to do something that I didn't want to. I think that's one of the lessons I've learned this year from all this COVID-19 burnout that I was suffering from. Do not push, do not put uh, unnecessary pressure on myself. Um, if there's something that I don't like to do and that I can actually avoid without uh, any substantial consequences, I simply should not do things. All right, so um, I guess I could launch a second terminal here and do a docker compose, uh, docker compose dc down simply to get rid of what we have running now. Okay. Here we have a clean setup now. So what are we running at the moment? Um, I'll... Uh, I'll explain it to you because I need to explain it to myself again, uh, just to remind myself. So what we did last time was um, creating a Docker image for not only our Ruby on Rails application, which is a, a fresh Rails project, um, but also making sure that uh, it's uh, extensible so we can, for example, add a database or two um, and have everything run isolated in Docker containers without things polluting my development workstation, without uh, having dependencies scattered all over the place. That's the main advantage of using Docker for your development environment. Everything is in Docker images and Docker containers. If need be, you can throw everything away without any uh, residue left over. And um, so, um, that's why I really love running my development environments in uh, Docker containers. Also, there are no side effects on uh, my workstation, uh, things like that. We started with building a Docker file. Uh, this Docker file uh, has multiple sections here. Um, we could even uh, add a few comments explaining what is actually happening here. Um, if you like, you can uh, use your channel points to uh, get me to add a few comments if you like. Slayer Darth, hey! Uh, doing well, I hope you're doing well as well. Uh, how are things over in the UK? It's so good to see all these familiar names. So yeah, um, doing well also, that's awesome. I'm really happy to hear that. I'm also happy that I got a very kind uh, comment over on my YouTube channel. Um, uh, being told that you are amazing is something that uh, definitely floats your boat, I guess. Uh, at least that applies to me. And um, so uh, thank you to the person that uh, commented on, my, uh, on one of my recent stream recordings. Uh, speaking of YouTube, um, I have uh, something that I'd ask you. If you haven't yet subscribed to my YouTube channel, I've just put the link in, in the chat. Um, it would be very kind and I would highly appreciate it if you would subscribe to my YouTube channel because I'm so close to the 100 subscribers limit where I can get a proper name and URL for my channel. and. Um, that would definitely make my day. Um, okay, so back to Docker. Um, first of all, here we start with installing stuff that we need for our Rails application. For example, we'll probably need the build essential packages 
to uh, compile native Ruby gems. We'll probably need the PostgreSQL um, client libraries. Um, with uh, libpqdev we get also the header files and stuff that we need, for example, to compile the uh, Postgres gem. Um, we'll also need Node.js for all the JavaScript stuff that is um, integrated with Rails 6 now. Um, by installing all this, we, we lay the foundation, we create our slash app work directory and um, install the bundler gem that will help us to bootstrap everything that we need. Slaydoff accidentally clicked the subscribe button. No worries. Um, apology accepted. Um, it's it's all good. But yeah, I decided to install a DOS game on DOSBox last night just to see what the fuss was all about. So you, now you have to tell us, of course, what DOS game you're talking about. Um, because there are many... DOS games that probably wouldn't get me to install DOSBox, but uh, there might actually be a few. Um, but most of all, I think um, uh, it would be the C64 games that would uh, trigger my nostalgia games like Last Ninja, for example. Uh, I was a huge uh, martial arts fan even uh, before I actually started um, training karate, and uh, so Last Ninja ticked all the boxes for 15 year old me or something like that. James Bond license to kill. I do remember there was a, one of the James Bond games at the beginning of the first person shooter era uh, that was quite decent. I'm not sure if it was license to kill. Um, but yeah, uh, there was actually, um, I do remember there was a um, James Bond f uh, FPS game that was quite decent. Learning 6502 on the C64. 6502 is a very nice assembler. Uh, the machine language of the 6502 and 6510 processors are uh, really nice. I really enjoyed doing a little bit of assembler programming back in the day. I never did something serious, but uh, just learning the stuff was fun. So, as always, the, the journey is the destination. Alright, so after installing Bundler, we copy the gem file and the gem file.lock. We start with these two files alone, um, because that's all that's necessary to run Bundle install. And after that's done, um, and uh, we've done the same for the JavaScript side of things, we finally add the rest of our source code. And by adding or by copying the gem file or the package JSON file um, uh, on their own, um, we make sure that we can use the caching feature in Docker because each of these statements will create a um, what's called a file system layer and uh, if the context of uh, a statement doesn't change, if the statement doesn't change and if the context of the statement doesn't change, for example if this gem file doesn't change, um, Docker will in subsequent builds reuse the e already existing file system layer. And so since we are going to do development, this last statement will always um, create a new layer um, but we definitely don't want to uh, run bundle install or yarn install for each and every single change we make anywhere in our code repository. So that's why um, we are breaking this up. Um, you, uh, uh, dealing with gem file and gem file .lock on their own, dealing with the package JSON file on their own, on its own, and um, only then 
um, we'll simply copy an updated uh, version of our repository into the container. So that's the first thing um, that we've built, and uh, this, this is a little bit of a refinement over what we initially had. And um, then um, we are switching to Docker Compose, which is a nice um, tool on top of Docker that allows us to run a set of containers. Um, because um, even though at the moment we only have our Rails application container, there's go probably going to be a database container or two as well. And Docker Compose allows us to define all these containers in a single YAML file here and use uh, Docker Compose up to uh, start all of them and Docker Compose down without any arguments to shut down everything. And that makes maintaining a development environment very, very simple. Monkey Island intro, yeah. Monkey Island was was is is probably one of the DOS games that would bring you back into an emul emulator. Lucasfilm games, uh, yeah, um, they had quite a few successes. Uh, Loom was another one, um, and of course uh, another studio that uh, had lots of success with their games at back in the time was uh, Sierra Online. So, um, what we're doing here is we define our app container here in the services section. We tell Docker Compose that we want to build uh, the image for this container ourselves by using our um, current working directory. The command uh, executed after spinning up the container is uh, actually launching Rails. Um, we define port 3000 as uh, exposed, which means Docker Compose will pick a port on my workstation and map this port to port 3000 of um, this container, which means that our Rails application, which runs on port 3000, will be exposed to my workstation on a port um, in the uh, 32000 region. And then we do another thing that's important while you're developing. So this is a development only setting here. We actually map our working directory into the slash app directory inside the container as a, um, basically as a mount, which means that um, uh, Docker for Mac in my uh, case here will make sure that all changes I make locally are instantly synced to the Docker container. Um, so uh, I don't have to build my container uh, again for each and every change. Changes will automatically be synced inside the container. Slayer Darth has a request, a retro Saturday stream where I talk about the different graphics adapters for the DOS machines like Hercules, which is a monochrome uh, graphics adapter, then uh, CGA, EGA, um, then we have VGA. Tandy is uh, similar, I think, to EGA and was uh, specific to uh, their line of machines. Uh, it had extended uh, color capabilities. I would be happy to talk about these things. And um, so let me make a note of your request in my stream notes. Topic ideas. Uh, now I have to type, oh dear, um, Retro Saturday. Um, let's call it Old Graphics. Adopters. Where did my focus go? Oh! Adapters. What just happened was um, something that I'm trying out at the moment. So, as you can see, my, my keyboard here isn't uh, very big. Um, while it still has a num row that I uh, start not using, um, we don't have any function keys, we don't have any arrow keys. And um, so that... Uh, at first forced me to introduce layers. Um, I can actually um, 
use uh, the uh, thumb keys down here um, to switch to different keyboard layers where for example I have my uh, cursor keys so if I hold this thumb key on the left side here and um, uh, then I can use the JKL keys and the I key as an inverted T arrow cluster, which means with the I key here I can go up, with the K I can go down, and with L and J I can go left and right. Uh, I also tried the uh, usual Vim um, mapping, but um, having uh, the cursor keys directly on my home row where my um, fingers rest, without having to shift to the left, and um, having this in an inverted T is uh, more convenient, especially on this author linear um, keyboard where the keys are actually arranged in an inverted T because everything is a grid more or less. So that's one thing, layers. I also have the thumb, cluster, uh, thumb uh, key here on the right where I can have um, uh, numbers, for example. So um, by holding this right thumb key, I can ha use my left hand and uh, this cluster of keys up here as a, a number pad where I have one, two, three, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and the zero down here on the thumb. Uh, that's also nice. Um, but even with layers, you tend to keep running out of space. And um, in the past few days, I've introduced chords to my uh, layout in order to challenge my brain even more. Chords means um, that keys pressed um, uh, at the same time result in different results and um, what I actually did was for example define the chord of my uh, pinky finger uh, of my um, uh, second and third fingers here if I press J and K at the same time it's backspace so I can leave my fingers as they are and simply press two keys at the same time and uh, that results in backspace and now that I try to roll on the left side pressing S and D um, at the same time uh, uh, at the same time which results in RS in my Colmac layout which is the RS at the end of adapters um, I actually mapped these two keys to escape so by quickly pressing R and S after, uh, after another, my keyboard actually um, interpreted this as escape and R S did not uh, appear on the screen instead of, uh, well, uh, at least I didn't cause anything to break um, by pressing escape. But um, I do have to change the source code for my firmware that um, the um, time between two key presses needs to be shorter. Um, I, uh, obviously I pressed R and S um, <clears throat> quickly enough for the keyboard to recognize it as a chord even though it wasn't and um, so uh, that's something that I need to change and I can do that right away so I don't forget. Uh, no, that's my notes. Where is my keyboard layout? Here we are. Um, that's QMK, the firmware source code for my keyboard here. And in my config.h, I can change the combo term from 75 milliseconds to 25 milliseconds. So next time I flash my keyboard firmware, um, I can actually make sure that this issue doesn't happen anymore. Bible clan member redeem posture posture check. Thank you very much. Welcome to Filzack Live. How are you doing, mate? Um, so let's put this away. Let's not keep distracting myself. Sladar said uh, there's something about retro computing where if you weren't around at a time can be difficult to envisage, understand it all. Yeah, that's one thing. <laughs> and sometimes it's really hard also to uh, understand the enthusiasm that people who actually uh, um, experienced the era um, tends to develop. And it might seem pretty weird um, that people are 
excited about, um, say, graphic standards that had uh, 640 by uh, 480. Um, uh, but I actually was uh, there when uh, that was a huge step forward. So I definitely do understand, for example, my wife who um, doesn't share this enthusiasm at all. All right, so Docker, um, we've mapped port 3000 to our workstation and we've connected the uh, working directory on my workstation with the slash app directory, so changes get synced automatically. PCM is waiting for an open source version of Notion. Uh, that's, that's an interesting thought. I don't expect there to be one uh, in the near future because Notion is pretty sophisticated. It still has quite a few shortcomings as well. Um, people keep asking uh, for more things, for example, calendar integration, something like that. Um, but um, it's uh, already uh, a pretty decent uh, application for uh, its purpose. If you're watching Uncle Bob's Clean Code lecture series, very interesting, a whole episode in there. What what should a CEO be doing? Uh, yeah, that's that's also interesting. I, I definitely do uh, love the the clean code um, uh, philosophy that uh, Robert Martin um, uh, introduced with his uh, solid principles and things like that. Um, and I was quite surprised that uh, he's a bit of a controversial figure in, in, in development circles as well. Um, I'm not sure why I haven't uh, looked into that yet. Um, maybe just because he's an, an older white dude and uh, so... Uh, uh, that might actually be, be the, 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 the only reason um, which uh, I can understand, um, but um, I'll have to look into that a little bit more to find out why people seem to have some kind of issues with uh, Robert Martin. Or maybe, yeah, uh, maybe it was something that he uh, actually said and uh, got himself into hot water as well. That's not unheard of. Nowadays, people really putting their foot in, in, in their mouths. Aiton Futuro, hey, how you doing? Welcome to Full Stack Live. Happy to have you here. Now, what do we actually want to do today? So uh, let me let me go back to my stream notes for today. Refine our Docker setup, test the image size reduction. Yeah, that was something that didn't work last time. Um, um, that has to do with the third file that I introduced, which is the dot... Um, wait, what? Where's the docker ignore file? Wait a minute. What's the reason that uh, my docker ignore file didn't have any effect because I did not have any docker ignore file? What is going on? You must be kidding me. There is no docker ignore file. Which file did I edit last time I did it? Wait, find dot docker ignore. There is no docker ignore file. Well, that is very strange. Okay, so let's uh, tackle that. Um, docker compose uh, build 
build up. So when I did this, it transfers the file into the Docker sphere. Oh, uh, Docker Compose doesn't show these uh, messages, so I need to use Docker build here. Okay, let's... Uh, oh, wait. No, it does not show me the... But still, let's build this application, then we can use uh, Docker Inspect, I think, to see the size of the image. And um, then we'll see uh, what uh, how the change how the size changed when I finally introduced the Docker ignore file. I must have uh, I must have edited something else then, and then wondering why uh, I didn't see any changes. Okay, that's embarrassing. Let's fix that. So, um, how do I find the size of a Docker image? Docker image size. How to get the size of a Docker image of, well, Docker images. That doesn't help. Let's go into the Docker help size. Docker images. To show all top level images, their repository and tags, and their size. So, Docker images alone should already tell me what, how all things are. Okay. So, I guess I'll use Docker build again. No, I can actually use the ID that it showed here. So, Docker image list, I guess. And then we'll grab for this ID. Or let's find out what uh oh come on. Um mystery inspect. Yeah, okay, with inspect I can get detailed information. So let's uh um Docker image inspect and then the image ID. D. Lots of stuff, layers and layers, and uh, where's the size? Here we have the image. I guess that's the size here, right? Yeah, okay, so it's... Wait. Uh, 1.7 megabytes, right? No, wait, that would be 1.7 gig. What? Slayerath said, old people have a tendency to lack a filter. Yeah, um, it's sometimes it's really amazing that people really can't read the room. And, uh, uh, well, at least it tends to show you uh, 
what kind of person they actually are below the surface. So sometimes it's a good thing that uh, they have this unintentional transparency. I just put said wanted to understand a good case scenario for Docker with Rails for a while. Yeah, so the I think the development environment scenario is is one of the uh, most sensible scenarios because um, it really allows you to run everything uh, in a self-contained bubble um, and if need be throw everything away um, without having any um, things left over on your workstation. You can run multiple versions of the same thing at the same time. So for example I could run one Rails application with a, a more current version of Postgres than uh, in a different project without having to somehow uh, manage to get both versions of Postgres installed on the same machine. Um, since they run in different um, Docker images and containers, uh, everything stays separated. And um, so um, I think um, development environment uh, is the best use case for, for Docker. Definitely. For example, I don't yet run um, my Rails applications in Docker containers in uh, production. I had a Kubernetes cluster for a short time, but then uh, we just didn't have the need of it and uh, maintaining it would just have been too much work. And uh, so we threw it away again. Um, we've so far been running our um, Rails applications on Heroku uh, in the traditional way and um, so uh, not using Docker in production at the moment however uh, definitely using it in development because it, it just th it keeps my my machine here clean. Now let's find out how to actually uh, get the real size because this here can't be the real size can it? Uh, this simple thing can't be well, yeah, it's a it's, uh, complete Debian image, so it might actually be 1.7 gig. Okay, now um, let's uh, save this. Uh, wait, wrong key. Oh man, I keep mistyping. Here we are. Uh, what I wanted was command. N for new. Uh, no, no, that's not it. Okay, here, that's the old size. And now let's actually introduce a Docker Compose file. No idea why that does not exist yet. New file. Uh, Docker ignore, I mean. Don't this is really strange. I don't know how this vanished. So, for example, let's exclude the node modules directory. We definitely don't need to have that in our um, Docker image because um, the build process runs yarn install anyway. Um, so we could actually build something like um, a caching mechanism, but um, let's uh, just uh, do it for the sake of seeing how... So, node modules. Then the same goes for the .git directory. Not only um, is it completely unnecessary to um, copy our git repository metadata into the container, it might actually um, expose stuff that we don't want to have exposed. For example, if I push the docker image to the, the docker hub and make that available for teaching purposes or something like that, or um, even uh, uh, push it to uh, docker hub or another registry to run it in production somewhere, um, we definitely don't want our .git directory in there. Okay, so let me save this file. Um, let's make sure it actually does exist. Docker ignore, yeah, there it is. Um, and let's do another build. Yeah, 
it uses the cache, which it should not. Uh, apparently Docker doesn't realize that there is now a Docker ignore file. Um, can I force a build? Let's find out if I can do that. Docker build help. Build, build. Dash, dash. Uh, we could use force rm to remove intermediate contains. Well, then it will only... Uh, we could use no cache. Okay, let's let's do that. Docker build dash dash no cache. Of course, this is going to take a little bit longer, but we will see if uh, this will result in a little bit of a smaller image. Titan Futura asked, maybe in production if you use EC2 or something like that instead of Heroku would be a good case for Docker. Well, uh, the, the most obvious way of um, using Docker for running my applications in production would be to use one of the Kubernetes hosted, uh, of the managed Kubernetes offerings that, um, for, so for example, it would be Amazon ECS, um, EKS of course, um, or um, Google Cloud, or something like that, where even uh, um, uh, DigitalOcean, for example, have their own managed uh, Kubernetes uh, hosting. And there you can uh, spin up um, containers. Um, and uh, since I already build an image, I could actually push that to a uh, public, publicly available uh, image registry instead of keeping it on my workstation here. And then um, run a Kubernetes cluster that pulls this image and runs it in one or even more instances. That's definitely a way to, to use um, Docker in production. And um, that opens the way to do things like, uh, for example, auto scaling, where you can say, OK, um, as soon as we get more than X requests per minute, or as soon as the load on a machine is high enough, we'll simply um, launch another um, container with the same application and uh, let the uh, load balancer of the uh, platform of choice take care of distributing traffic between all these container instances. And um, that makes uh, scaling an application, uh, at least the front end of, a, of, of an application, quite, um, quite simple and easy. You push your image once and then you can spin up as many containers with this image as you like and all these containers will talk to the same database so uh, that's an easy way to distribute um, load between multiple instances of your application and docker makes this this uh, very very easy there are still challenges of course nothing comes for free but um, it's definitely a, a common use case nowadays, especially with uh, things like uh, microservices applications. Back when we had our own Kubernetes cluster, for example, um, I did run our websites, which are simple static websites um, in Kubernetes. And um, so uh, the build process was basically running Jekyll, generating all the uh, content. And um, then I created an image from uh, this build process. And then I was able to tell our Kubernetes cluster to take uh, each of our website images and run two instances of them. And since they were simple static websites with a simple, I, I don't know, with a simple web server in front that served these static files, um, it was very simple to, to run two instances of each website and uh, therefore make our websites um, more resilient against uh, 
and issues, uh, network issues or things like that, because even if one of the instances would um, become unreachable, the other would still be there. And um, that was a great simple way to run um, uh, a simple website uh, in some kind of a high availability setup. Kubernetes basically is um, a whole system for running Docker containers. And with system, I mean everything that's necessary to um, spin up these containers, to monitor these containers, to make sure the containers are still reachable, um, to automatically have them um, restart when, uh, for example, um, their images get updated, um, everything that uh, goes beyond the simple uh, use case that we are doing here with Docker Compose, where I simply have a simple file that defines um, which containers I want to be uh, running, um, that's where Kubernetes comes into play. Uh, as soon as it gets more complex uh, than what uh, Docker Compose can handle, Kubernetes or K8S, uh, in short, um, is definitely a good option. The downside is that you don't have that you uh, have to deal with many uh, with many YAML files instead of just one. Which managed Docker hosting provider? I would recommend. Um, now, um, note that I don't have any current experience running uh, Kubernetes applications. Um, I would either choose um, DigitalOcean because they um, keep tend to keep things simple, and um, uh, my first steps into using Kubernetes in production would definitely be simple steps. Uh, so I would use the simpler and probably uh, more cost-effective cost um, solution, which is uh, DigitalOcean. Digital um, if I had some serious workloads to run, I would probably go to Google, um, simply because um, they are the pioneers in running Kubernetes. They developed and, uh, well, they basically invented Kubernetes, and uh, that's why I... Uh, trust them to run um, a solid platform for it as well. Of course, uh, I, uh, that doesn't mean that I would um, want to discourage you from using something like uh, Amazon EKS. Um, I simply don't have any experience with it, so I don't have any reason to, to uh, 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 not recommend EKS, EKS as well, but if it was me, I would keep my options simple use DO for um, the more simple stuff and as soon as we grow and tend uh, or reach some limits with DigitalOcean, if at all, then I would consider switching to Google. Yeah, configuration files, hell. Um, uh, dealing with Kubernetes means uh, dealing with uh, tens of YAML files, or even hundreds. Of course, there are tools that, uh, um, again, uh, make this easier, but still. Okay, haven't made any progress today uh, uh, yet. <laughs> we are uh, even uh, already halfway through this session. Okay, so Docker ignore. Uh, we did build our image here. Now let's... Uh, try and uh, inspect this one. Uh, let me see. Uh, we could actually try and... Uh, grab uh, something like... Oh, let's do a dash i size. Wait, what? Yeah, that's not correct. I wanted to copy this one here. So another chord that I've defined is pressing the uh, second and fourth finger here 
uh, deletes the whole word. So that makes things a little bit more convenient as well. Here we go. And yes, we did have some kind of success. So uh, that's the new size. We basically went down by about a hundred megabytes, actually. Yeah, which would, uh, which could be the size of the node modules and the Git repositories. Your managed WordPress hosting provider is screwing you over. They've configured Git LFS to disallow any videos from being tracked on their repositories. So they basically keep you from uh, streaming video from uh, your WordPress host. Well, if only I knew of a WordPress host who would, who, who would not uh, keep you from doing that. Not doing any further plugs here. Fuller's Novel, hey, how you doing? Welcome to Full Stack Live. I hope you're having a great Thursday. Slaydar says, uh, we used to just upload files via SFTP, but a few months ago they gave us the ability to configure Git remotes. That when push to would trigger an automated deployment process. Yes, that's how our deployment process works as well. And it uh, actually used Git exclusively from the start. We didn't even build uh, the, op the, the option of uploading stuff via SFTP because um, even 10 years ago seemed anachronistic. And um, since we wanted to work with more sophisticated web agencies anyway, uh, we said, okay, let's, let's uh, not do SFTP um, at all and uh, do only Git. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it, it has been working well for us. So sometimes we had to educate people a little, little bit and we were happy to provide some Git training, uh, but uh, in the um, overall, it, it wasn't really the, the, the right decision to make. First time it was Docker. I was called a Docker hater at work yesterday. Well, uh, justifiably or not? That's the big question here. So, now at least um, uh, the confusion I had on Saturday uh, has lifted. So, with using the Docker ignore file, we can actually reduce the size of our image. Um, not substantially, of course, because it's a whole. Um, Linux setup with Ruby and everything, but and, and my node modules fi uh, directory might not be um, huge yet. At least it's uh, only a demo project, of course. But um, yeah, I can highly recommend um, using a Docker ignore file and uh, excluding stuff that you do definitely don't want to have running inside your container. For example, node modules and Git, maybe your .n file and things as well. Oh, okay, I don't mind Docker, but I'm not on the Docker hype train. You don't have to be. I'm not on the Docker hype train as well. Don't see any reason why. Sometimes it's a good tool, sometimes it's not. Simple as that. Okay, now that uh, actually allows me to tick off uh, this part here, test image size reduction. Now, wait, what, what else do we not need to do? We, need, we should change the user account, especially if we want to use our image um, and run it in production. It shouldn't use the root account as it does at the moment. Uh, and uh, there is a way to change your Docker file to run a different user. You'd have to create it, of course. Um, that's something that I'll do later because that's more uh, cosmetics or more geared towards the production uh, scenario, which I uh, which is not in my focus at the moment. Mm. So I guess the next step would be. What if I want to run a database? Yep, 
If you're not on the hype train, you are a hater. I don't think so. Come on, I've been doing Linux since 1993, and uh, I uh, experienced all this narrow-minded thinking back then. Uh, you can either be for Linux or you uh, are a, a Windows uh, dummy. Um, life's not that simple. All this dogmatic thinking does not really improve our world. I actually did use Windows 95 back in the day for a while. But now I'm a Mac hipster, exactly and still a Linux fan. Linux pays for my shoes, so I'm not gonna complain. Um, yeah, database. So it's not very hard to add a database to the mix here. I just add the database as the second service in here. So let's um, do that. Um, we'll have um, another service called Postgres. Postgres. We don't have to build this ourselves, so uh, we can simply reuse existing images. Um, image. Um, and uh, I'll use the Postgres image. And um, so far I've always been using the uh, 9.4 label and version. Um, not, sh not even sure if that's the most current version, but uh, it did the trick so far. So uh, let's keep doing that and then we'll have to say our app container actually depends on the Postgres container um, that will for example influence the spin up order um, doesn't make much sense to spin up the Rails application when the database isn't there yet so um, let's uh, actually uh, add a depends on section here depends underscore on colon and uh, here we'll list Postgres as one of the dependencies. Postgres. Now, I already did DC down, uh, now we'll do DC up. That was cu quite quick because the, the image was already on my workstation. I've been using this image a lot. Um, but uh, it did not spin up because it says you must specify the Postgres password for the super user. Um, you may also use Postgres host auth method equals trust. So now we are going deeply into development territory by setting the environment variable. Oops. Interesting. Oh yeah. See, now I rolled en too quickly and it actually did um, use backspace instead of entering EN. I really need to reduce the chord term in my firmware. Uh, environment. And it's not equals trust in this case, it's uh, colon. Trust. 
let's uh, stop this and do a DC up again. Now Postgres is actually starting up and my Rails application is running as well. So with just four additional lines in our Docker Compose file, I was able to um, add a second container to the mix. And if I go into my other terminal here, I can use uh, Docker Compose. DC is just an alias in my um, shell here for docker-compose. Docker Compose um, PS will show us these two um, containers. Um, so Docker Compose keeps everything um, clean because uh, it uses this uh, Docker Compose YAML file here and it only shows me the relevant containers as well. Even uh, if I would be running many more containers, and I might actually be, uh, let's find out by running the raw docker ps command. Docker ps, no, I don't actually. Uh, there are no uh, other projects running at the moment, but even if I would be running other projects, I would still only see these two containers with the Docker Compose PS because it keeps things um, in the scope of my current project. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's catch up with chat here. Windows 95 Hype, remember, it's amazing to see photos of you ripping Windows 95 boxes off the shelves. Yeah, well, it was definitely a, a progress compared to Windows uh, 3.1 uh, and uh, especially Windows for workstations, if you do remember that. But uh, as soon as OS 2 uh, uh, was available, I switched to uh, IBM OS 2, uh, especially since I wanted to run uh, my bulletin board system even uh, while I was using the machine for my own uh, programming work. Uh, and OS 2's multitasking was very uh, superior to what uh, Windows 95 offered. Uh, Slayer thinks it's difficult to be a Windows guru. Um, well, there are definitely Windows gurus around. Um, uh, if all you use day in day out uh, is uh, Windows at a power user level, um, that's uh, what you become, I guess. And many of my uh, colleagues in the live coders are definitely something that I would call um, Windows gurus. People you, who use um, .NET, C Sharp and uh, uh, all these technologies that Microsoft keeps churning out. Um, Fudas Nabel was an Archon Archimedes fanboy at the time. Of course you were. Risk architecture for the win, am I right? Their command line documentation is atrocious. Well, um, yeah, but I wouldn't use documentation quality against Windows specifically because uh, there will be many uh, Linux or Mac based um, projects uh, in the wild where you could say the same about that doc documentation. Fuller Snob is really good at picking out the losers of the pack, just as the Archon Archimedes, I guess. Uh, well, yeah, OS2 um, went the way of the Dodo as well. Um, but uh, doesn't uh, change the fact that there were groundbreaking technology back uh, in their day. PowerShell Doc is pretty good. Well, PowerShell, I think, is seems to be one of the uh, better um, Microsoft applications because uh, it, I, I know people who are very excited about it. Wondering how that port 3000 works on your machine. Uh, yes, that was uh, something um, that I wanted to point out because I, I saw that you um, uh, had um, a hard mapping to port 3000 um, on your machine. Um, that's something that I try to avoid uh, mapping um, 
uh, static ports on my workstation because I can never anticipate uh, which projects I'm running at the same time and only one project can take over my Max port 3000 and that's why I do not um, map any port on my host machine here by adding the colon 3000 or any other port. Um, I let Docker Compose take care of that. And that's something that I should actually add to this project as well, um, uh, because it re is really useful and will be something that you can use yourself. Um, so what I do is I use this information here, where Docker Compose actually tells me to which port on my machine it has mapped port 3000 by simply stating uh, by listing port 3000 here in my docker compose yaml file i ask docker compose to map this internal port from the container somewhere on my host machine where a port number is free and in this case um, docker compose choose port 32771 here um, if I power down my uh, container stack and uh, launch it again, it will use the next free port number. Uh, so let's uh, try this. Uh, I'll switch to my Docker Compose terminal here, press Ctrl C to stop everything, and then do Docker Compose up to start everything again. It's still internally port 3000 here. However, if I do a DCPS here, you can see the port number on my machine here has changed. Uh, that simply makes sure that uh, I don't have any conflicts, even if I run uh, the containers of five different projects at the same time. Uh, of course, having to use the Docker Compose PS to find out which port it is now is a little bit tedious and that's why I've um, written uh, a few helper scripts that actually tell me and I can simply copy them from my Freiselbox dashboard project here where I have put them into the bin directory. So there is the um, URL command. Yeah, it's the URL command here where I actually call docker compose port app 3000, which tells me where did you map port 3000 of my app container? And then I use this information to output a URL that I can click directly. And uh, I can simply go ahead and copy this. So let's... Um, um, yank this and let's create a URL file here URL and uh, did not work uh, let's uh, try paste uh, p here we go <laughs> delete to hash save. Uh, let's do a It's really interesting to see my brain struggling with my keyboard layout because I uh, without talking and having people watch me, um, I actually have um, a more decent um, typing experience. I can't even prove that. Where's my mother browser, browser window? I guess it's this one here. Um, as you can see, I've been using monkey type here and I actually got to 31 WPM. However, um, uh, it's a completely different beast doing this on stream. So change mod Maybe I'm even overthinking things and uh, uh, I should let my newly building muscle memory take over instead of uh, over focusing on this. It's really interesting to learn how the brain works. Uh, change mod uh, plus x uh, bin 
slash uh, URL. So now I can call bin URL and I'll get my current uh, application URL. Bin slash URL will actually tell me, well, you have to visit uh, localhost 32772. Uh, and um, I could actually try and click that. Uh, where is my... Yeah, that's the right browser. Here we go. Now it's talking to my application and yes, it works. What I could also do is um, use the open command here in my Mac terminal. Uh, open and then simply use uh, something like this. Come on, bin slash uh, URL. That way I can open the URL directly. hope that explains how I go about things. Now let's catch up with chat again. Slaydoff says, I'm pretty good on the Windows command line, but their documentation isn't the best, not when compared to the GNU docs. Okay, interesting. Don't forget to find uh, PowerShell is much better documented though, agreed, okay. Fullersnabel says, .NET doc though, yikes. And you're not even a .NET hater, apparently. On the other hand, Fuller's novel says, I am kind of rubbish at Linux, but I did learn a bit about the differences between Demon Tools, Systemd, and Supervisor-D this weekend. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's uh, some knowledge that will come in handy, um, how to spawn services and things like that. I had to deal with that myself a lot. Yes, um, building on closed source stuff uh, creates different kinds of dependencies than using open source. Um, for example, depending on the uh, user interface of the documents provided. I guess that's the same between uh, Windows development and, for example, development on macOS. Uh, just walled gardens, I guess. Fuller Snabel asks, how many Node developers understand the Linux API when they build Electron apps? Yes, uh, same thing. On the other hand, it's always a trade-off. Uh, I do understand that uh, you can't understand everything if it's not uh, your core business. I do not deal with things that are not my core business myself, because my core business is complex enough as it is. Um, and so there's always the, 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 a decision to make if you want to go deep on everything um, and not focus on what's actually important, uh, which is creating uh, customer happiness. Um, learning is a good thing. Um, I keep telling you that, um, and that's uh, one of the main reasons I'm doing this stream. Um, but uh, you can't learn everything and uh, you need to make uh, a choice what you want to learn and what you need to learn and what you can leave in the hands of other people. So yeah, uh, there's always trade-offs to make. Fuller Snabel says, I'm sometimes disgusted by the layers and layers of abstraction we build between us and the hardware. That's correct. And that again is, uh, of course, uh, not without a purpose. These abstraction layers make sense if you don't overdo them. Kids at work are convinced JavaScript is the final language. Well, I guess that's a, that's a comfortable world to live in, even if it's just an imaginary world. So leave them be. They'll learn in time. All you get when you try to convince them otherwise will be an okay boomer. All righty. Um, now, I guess that was something that I left out in my uh, chan and my stream goals here. 
Well, it's it's a under refined Docker setup, I guess. So let's add a sub point here uh, called helper scripts. Come on, helper scripts. And we can tick that off. That I sh guess should go under here as well. Oh, let's uh, move that here. Okay, so anything else we need to do, I guess? Well, of course, uh, yes. Um, in order for my application to use this database that is available now, um, and by the way, um, Docker Compose uses the service names as the basis of the host names as well. So um, uh, this container will internally be reachable under the name Postgres. And since I don't, uh, I did not change the default port of the database, it's quite easy to access this database under the name Postgres. And since I added this uh, environment variable, I can actually also um, access the database without authentication, which makes things easier as well. Um, all I need to do for it to be actually used is to change my um, um, application configuration, of course. So let's go into config database YAML, where I actually have to change the uh, SQLite adapter to Postgres. Postgres. And database, I guess, is development. Oops. So something that I keep stumbling over is that I unintentionally look at my um, key legends. I thought, well, I'm doing touch typing anyway, so um, it doesn't matter if uh, the key legends don't reflect my actual key layout, but I uh, keep um, unintentionally uh, looking at the key legends and then distract or confuse myself. Um, so um, that's uh, an issue that I need to resolve eventually. I need to get proper legends for my keyboard here. So that's that. Uh, I do not specify a host name or a username. Well, I guess I need to uh, specify a host name. Let's do that. Host name, which is Postgres. I think I don't have to specify a username and a password because um, I'm using this um, authentication-less setup, but um, let me take a look at my other application, how I did it there. Config database YAML. I actually did specify host, username and password. Okay, well, let's simply steal that then. I don't have to repeat that since I've defined it in default. Uh, I just need to de uh, define different uh, database uh, schema names here, which I did. And that means I should be able to actually access the database in my setup. I just have to restart everything. Mind you, I don't have to rebuild my container because uh, I've mapped the um, uh, volume f um, between my workstation directory, my project directory, and the container. 
so that should reflect automatically. And um, now I should be able to run DB setup in my container, which I can do using Docker Compose exec application container rails db setup nope did not work what did not work the Postgres adapter can't be used. Oh, of course. Yeah, I actually need to um, provide my application with the proper adapter, which unfortunately means that making changes to the uh, gem file and therefore rebuilding my container image. So we'll use the PG gem, is it? So um, we'll do that with the running application container. So I'll simply go uh, do another run here in uh, Docker Compose exec and uh, let's run bundle install. Bundle install. My changes have already been synced into the container and now it's fetching PG and compiling native extensions. And that was quick. The rebuild of the whole container image will take longer, but it's not necessary at the moment. And uh, that should actually be sufficient to restart my application and then do the DB setup. Right, did I forget anything? First I said I have some understanding though as I was arrogant at the same age and thought there was nothing to learn from tech older than six months. Yeah. And thanks for the hint, oh, Julian. I found out myself eventually, even though you probably saw it before me. Okay, um, let's try our DB setup again. It is DB setup, right? Man, still doesn't work. Postgres adapter. Yeah, it. I guess is it PG then? Uh, let me check. How does the adapter name? PostgreSQL is it is okay. PostgreS uh, QL. Mm. Oh, I don't have to do the bundle install, and I guess we could try DB setup again because it tends to load everything on demand, right? Yes! And now we have to run Rails DB Migrate. <laughs> migrate. Both for development and test. I think uh, with Rails 6, DB Migrate does both at the same time. But just to be sure. Let's run rails underscore env equals test. Well, there's no models to create anyway because we haven't created any yet, but now. Uh, 
we are ready to do some serious development. We have an application um, running in a, a container and uh, the database. And of course, in the same way, we could also add a third container, for example, running Redis, if that's something we need for uh, features like um, uh, asynchronous worker jobs with, um, uh, what's it called, uh, Rescue. Or um, I have been using the rollout gem to uh, implement feature flags, which also uses Redis as its um, data store. Um, so adding a third container wouldn't be any different. I would simply add two to four more lines uh, here in my docker-compose.yaml and uh, I would have a third container talking um, to the rest of the containers here. Sledath says, I love learning about retro tech. It has taught me a lot, surprisingly. Yeah, surprising that you can actually learn from the past. Um, and Fulas now says, by the way, Prime subbed to motivate you continue streaming. Thank you very much. I think uh, there m might have been uh, a problem because my activity feed doesn't show me any subscription and I would have expected an alert as well. But um, it's the intention that counts. So uh, uh, still, thank you a lot. Uh, it actually does motivate me, uh, not because um, uh, money motivates me. Uh, I uh, live a simple life and I have uh, enough money to, to fund that. Uh, but uh, it's the gesture that counts and uh, people uh, actually uh, spending real life money um, on my stream means I provide them with uh, value and that's what actually motivates me. Jim Butterfield. That's a name that I'm not familiar with. Arm Assembler was very refreshing, 1993. Uh, I have never looked at Arm Assembler. That's one of the um, platforms I did not code any assembler for. No idea how ARM Assembler does look like, but uh, it might be an interesting stream topic as well. Fulas Nava says, it says I am subscribed, perhaps it shows up later. Yeah, maybe it's just my, my dashboard here. Let me take a look at uh, my phone dashboard. No idea. Streamlabs hasn't uh, upgraded uh, the latest subscriber information at the bottom as well, so I'm not sure what went wrong there. But no worries, as I said, it's the gesture that counts. Uh, motivation has actually been applied. All right, folks, I think that's actually a point where we could uh, wrap things up for today. Uh, I do have all that I wanted to achieve, which is basically um, prepare an article and a YouTube video that I want to create about building this uh, application development environment in Docker. Uh, I wanted to see what pitfalls there are, and I found quite a few. Um, but um, the current state of my um, demo directory here will be uh, fine to do a write-up and then uh, create a YouTube video for that as well. So I said, no, don't leave us. Okay, okay, I'll stick around for a while. But I guess uh, I'll switch to chat. So, um, I want to make a bit more of a habit to actually write things down. Um, 
So let me make a few notes about today. We still haven't explored on build statements, but that's more if you want to actually pro create images for production. And uh, same goes for the user account. It doesn't really matter uh, if I'm running my application as root on my development workstation here. It definitely does matter if I run it in production in the on the internet. Um, so that's something maybe for a follow-up running Docker in production, which would also be an interesting topic. But notes and learnings from today. Uh, let's note the dot docker ignore file docker ignore oh, come on. file does actually work If you create it. If you... Then, um, what else have we learned? Well, let me check chat. For example, says, perhaps I can open a ticket to AWS using a premium AWS support deal at work and ask what the heck happened to your subscription. Yeah, Amazon, where's my money? <laughs> Give me che Jeff on the phone. Metsu Gadoken, welcome to Footstack Live. Happy to have you here, even though we are just in uh, about to wrap up things. You're right, I'm, I'm super lazy watching other people do stuff motivates you to do some actual work. I, I don't think that's that's uh, too weird. Um, um, and um, as I keep telling my kids, if, if I'm not a, a good example, I can always uh, uh, still be a deterrent. So... Uh, you're fine. Any learnings apart from creating files does make a change. Nothing that comes to mind. Okay. And actually I do the same uh, uh, Mitsuka token. Uh, my uh, sometimes I simply switch on a stream uh, of uh, probably of one of my the live coders colleagues um, and uh, watch them do something um, seeing that other people's have the discipline to uh, do something for example uh, do a live coding session uh, then uh, gets my ass in gear to, to do something myself instead of just vegetating in front of the TV or something like that. And yes, of course, uh, you're welcome to hang out here anytime you like. This is a good place to hang out and uh, just have a chat, be relaxed, chill out. Twitch education is pretty diverse. I, I agree, Slayer the Roth, um, and there's a huge range of topics, uh, especially in the science and technology section. Uh, it's very impressive and uh, uh, there's so much stuff to learn. Yeah, there, uh, especially with COVID-19, um, we actually have actual uh, university professors join the live coders because they uh, were forced to uh, do their lectures online and uh, some of them chose Twitch as their platform and uh, I, know, I know at least one um, university professor who is doing computer science lectures on Twitch and doing office hours and uh, Q&A sessions publicly simply because um, it's a, 
a cost-effective and, uh, in general, effective way of reaching their stu students and, and doing things. We also have uh, uh, um, uh, someone who has an actual PhD in physics doing quantum computing uh, live on Twitch. Um, uh, so that was very impressive, very impressive, and a little bit uh, in intimidating as well, having people of that caliber um, on the same team uh, makes me feel a uh, little, li little bit inadequate from time to time. Uh, people who do actual quantum computing, um, while I'm struggling with building a proper Docker ignore file. Quantum computing may give me CTC computers now? What is CTC? I have no idea. Don't even recognize the icon. That's an in joke I don't get. Uh, no, I did not mean uh, Simulius. I meant. Um, oh, I don't actually remember his name. The professor is a. Um, uh, he he teaches at a German university. Uh, I think he actually teaches at uh, uh, the college where I, of which I graduated from. Um, not sure. Closed time-like curve. Basically, you can send results from the future. That sounds like something that I would be interested in. Now, let's uh, find some someone we can raid, shall we? Um, let me check out my live coders colleagues. Live coders. CLW is streaming and uh, I guess we'll rate Corey. Yeah, CLW is, is great. Um, Marcus asks Wibbly Wobbly Timey Wimey When does Doctor Who come back? Uh, shouldn't there be some kind of uh, announcement when when the series goes come comes back when the new series comes i'm really missing doctor who begin bot is a pretty cool guy he is definitely uh, i'm i'm a regular in his chat as well because he's he's a great guy he's funny he's uh, very um uh He's very prolific in, in all kinds of things. He, he plays some mean guitar and uh, he does uh, a lot of Vim content. So yeah, of course I am a fan of Begin. Uh, Julian says sandwiches, which actually um, makes me notice that I'm quite hungry. It's dinner time. Um, what? what? What's the problem with being a Doctor Who fan? Come on, it's it's such an old series. It's been running since the 1960s. Uh, you have to respect that. Oh yes, the pseudo sandwiches, definitely. <laughs> Bacon plays a vim like a guitar as well. Yeah, he's a vim virtuoso. All right, so let me try and uh, enter my raid command here if I manage to do that. Oh dear, raid. CL. Dub. Yeah, here we go. Does it work though? 
Don't get a button here. UI is broken. Can't actually click a button if there isn't any. Oh dear. Let's try and reload. Button is there. Good. Alrighty, folks. So, I guess that's it for today. I intend to be back on Saturday. If you don't yet follow the channel, please do so. I highly appreciate it. I would also appreciate you uh, subscribing to my YouTube channel. Another shameless plug to get my individual URL over on YouTube, where I am going to um, post this recording as well. And uh, again, I had a great session here. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks for chatting. And uh, I hope to see you on Saturday. Until then, um, thank you for watching. Have a great one and see you soon. Cheers.